Dobrý den, dámy a pánové. Vítejte v kempu v Centru architektury a městského plánování. Mé jméno je Štěpán Bertl a já vás tady vítám na masterclass s Ivanem Bánem, o kterém trochu řeknu v češtině, ale pak přejdu do angličtiny, protože celá masterclass bude probíhat v angličtině. Jedná se o doprovodný program k výstavě, kterou jsme zahájili právě dnes. Výstava, která se jmenuje Prague Diary, neboli Pražský denník a vychází z takového výletu, který tady Ivan za sedm dní na kole pěšky a helikoptérou <laughs> projel z minulý rok. But uh, I, I'm going to switch to English now just to do a, a short introduction, although I'm sure you're going to do that yourself. Um, Ivan Bahn is a, is a world-renowned photographer of architecture, although I'm sure, as he's going to tell you in a little bit, he sees himself more as a documentary photographer, um, where people and how the buildings actually interact with their surroundings, that's what is important to Ivan and his, his work. Uh, he has been working with uh, you know, Pivora of uh, super famous architects, starting with Rem Kolhas and on his CCTV building in Beijing, which I believe started your career uh, way, way back. Uh, and then with uh, names such as Sana, Herzog de Meron, Bjarke Ingels, and anyone who is anyone in, in the architectural world. Um, as I said before, uh, the project that we did here together in Prague uh, called the Prague Diary is a little bit different and it goes back kind of into that documentary aspect and, and seeing the city and how people actually use it and interact with it. But um, I'm sure uh, Ivan's going to talk about that, but also about a lot of his other uh, projects all around the world. So yeah, without further ado, Ivan, please take it away. Yes, thank you all for coming this morning. Um, uh, I thought I'd give you a little bit uh, an, an overview of uh, different projects I've been working on, how my um, uh, practice sort of shaped uh, over the years and uh, how I fell into this field. Um, so, yeah, I started um, uh, my background. Uh, I studied um, uh, art, art school, photography. I've been basically always photographing my whole life. Um, uh, coming out of art school, I didn't really have so much a direct focus of uh, what I wanted to show and tell as a photographer. Um, I did mainly documentary photography, kind of people, places, um, and so on. I was traveling quite a bit and so, but it was not until 2004, 2005 that kind of by accident I met Rem Koolhaas, the Dutch architect, and it was a very particular moment there in the office, like there were four major projects which were just finished at that time, the Seattle Public Library, uh, the Casa de Musica in Porto, the Berlin uh, Embassy and the IIT in Chicago, uh, four kind of major projects there for the office. So, um, and, and there was the construction of the CCTV, the CCTV tower in Beijing, at the time one of the largest office buildings in the world. And I proposed to them uh, to start documenting that, like the idea was that that uh, construction would um, uh, happen over a period of three, four years or so. Um, in the end, um, it's, yeah, you could say almost still ongoing, uh, we're 18 years later. Um, uh, 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 part of the building is, is in use, but part of it um, is still uh, uh, not uh, fully uh, completed. Let me see if the clicker works. Um, the, yeah. Um, ah, there we go. Yes. So um, that was uh, uh, yeah a period of of a rapid change, of course, in in China to uh, like that period 2005 to 2008, kind of uh, towards the uh, Beijing uh, Olympics. Uh, the city was in in a massive change of like everything. I think the clicker is still not really responding. Um, so, uh, like you saw, uh, huge parts of the city being demolished, other parts being built up. There was this massive building coming up um, uh, with, like, yeah, it's all migrant workers coming from the countryside, 
often haven't seen like a building taller than maybe two stories and building it almost kind of by hand, these massive new buildings. If there is another clicker or I don't know what's... <laughs> okay, <laughs> good, good. Um, so like there, it, it was kind of a, almost a city on, on the side, uh, like uh, of the people who were... Thank you so much. Let's see if this works. Mm, yeah, there we go. Um, so almost a kind of mini city there on these construction sites uh, of these people building these uh, places. Like at CCTV there were at moments about 10,000 construction workers on the site uh, building uh, that uh, tower. Uh, yeah, it felt almost by hand, like kind of manual uh, labor the moment you have like uh, uh, 10 guys carrying a uh, huge beam of steel, like that was easier than getting a, a, a big crane. So that sort of juxtaposition of these different worlds, these very sort of personal moments of the workers uh, versus the city being uh, changed, these massive buildings coming up, uh, that was totally fascinating to see. So that was kind of my introduction in the architectural field. And uh, since I was there a lot, I was there like every uh, six to eight weeks or so, uh, seeing uh, those changes going around in the city, um, uh, photographing uh, that site. Um, I, I met um, yeah, other Chinese architects there. I met uh, Jacques and Pierre from Herzog and the Meuron, started documenting also the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Olympic uh, Stadium. And so, so a lot of things, like it was a moment that there, yeah, that city was in a, a big change. And like I felt I, uh, with that kind of subject matter, I could really combine all my interest in documentary, photography, people, places, um, how these cities are changing, um, these massive uh, yeah, impacts uh, in these kind of places. So CCTV I followed for many years. Um, there's the smaller building which you see here in the back, the TVCC uh, tower, which was uh, supposed to be a hotel, um, uh, which is still like not completely open. There was this uh, big fire uh, in the construction site just days basically before the opening. Um, and uh, so the project is also very fraught with a lot of controversies. Um, which, yeah, uh, you try to show like in, in these kind of juxtapositions between yeah, the workers, the city, uh, and this sort of, uh, yeah, yeah, the very forward-looking architecture at the same time. Um, you'll see here a couple images of the construction of the Olympic Stadium. Um, this massive steel uh, uh, edifice coming up. Like that whole site, it's everything is kind of steel workers, um, uh, construction materials, and then you have these kind of barracks around it where people, uh, yeah, live for months at a time, and so these sort of very personal moments, uh, people doing their everyday things, watching TV, uh, uh, having dinner, uh, um, and so on, and you have these enormous construction sites uh, going up there in the background. So totally fascinating time um, uh, to be there. And it informed me a lot, sort of, yeah, in the way also like how these buildings are constructed. And I think for, for me, what's what's always important to uh, photograph that it's, it's not just like architecture, but you feel kind of the bones of the architecture, like how these buildings came up and uh, that it's not just a, a sort of a design, but there's a, uh, like really a, a structure, an exposed structure, and especially I feel with these two projects, yeah, uh, the structure became the architecture, and there's very little extra uh, to it. Um, and these were some images of the opening um, uh, ceremony of the games um, in 2008, where the, yeah, the building was uh, fully in use. And so from there, uh, yeah, I started working with more and more architects. Um, uh, and for me, like, yeah, uh, being still, I feel kind of novice in the architectural field. Like, it's, um, you try not to only show, like, that building as a sort of isolated object, but it's really sort of in its context in the city. Um, like, uh, you try to tell a story, like, why is that building there and not somewhere else? Um, the sort of 
uh, yeah, uh, how that how it's constructed. The, those kind of bones uh, of of a building really fascinate me, and so that these are kind of ways I often select projects why uh, I tend to photograph uh, some projects uh, versus others. Um, here you see another one of Rem Koolhaas uh, buildings in Doha, in Qatar. Um, actually two buildings there, the headquarters of the Qatar Foundation and the Qatar National Library. Um, uh, totally abstract projects from the outside, this giant cube and then this sort of uh, s uh, s uh, slow slung um, uh, diamond shaped uh, uh, library there in the background, kind of scaleless objects, and um, that's also always something uh, which is yeah really nice to play with that kind of scale in the photographs. I I love to include people and sort of their um, their daily things in these kind of things, and when uh, you have that kind of architecture which becomes kind of scaleless in the background. Um, yeah, those are uh, 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 interesting things to play with. Coming inside there, the building, yeah, you have these sort of endless rows of uh, stacked uh, book uh, cases going up uh, on both sides. Um, and uh, it has a kind of scale, almost like an airport terminal, but then there's beautiful sort of detailed moments. Uh, of this kind of labyrinth, uh, rare books library, which is kind of half underground, which you look uh, on top of um, uh, from above. Uh, Zaha Hadid in Baku, yeah, uh, a sort of, uh, yeah, a complete abstraction of, of a project uh, like that when you look it up close in the previous image, um, like this. Um, uh, but once you zoom out and you see it in the city, um, uh, it's also that uh, complete juxtaposition of this uh, white uh, veil there in, in the middle of a city, which was also in a big change. It was also during the time I was working there uh, with uh, uh, students from Harvard, uh, the GSD, uh, to do a book on uh, Baku, a city which um, yeah, changed a lot during three particular moments in its history and all kind of based on uh, the discovery of oil and the oil booms and busts um, which really formed that city. Um, and then you see another one of those, uh, uh, yeah, the, like the Zahadid project, uh, which uh, yeah, has, uh, happened also again during one of the, uh, yeah, the last uh, oil boom there. Uh, where yeah, the, a city and a country tries to uh, redefine itself. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah, my commissioned work is usually for architects, and it's usually these kind of yeah, the newest, shiniest, uh, brightest object, which is just finished. Uh, often these kind of larger cultural projects where you can tell that story on the city, on its use, on the people, and so on. Uh, but um, I. I keep finding myself coming back more and more also to uh, yeah, uh, looking at uh, places, architecture from uh, decades ago, um, these sort of uh, large ideas of city building, nation building and so, and how architects play the role in that, um, how people take it eventually completely over. Um, you see that kind of role of the architect uh, kind of diminishing and a city really sort of being taken over by its users. Um, this is a series I did for uh, a book uh, about 12 years ago. Um, uh, it was the time that it was the 50th uh, anniversary um, of the uh, um, construction of Brasilia. Um, and uh, we decided to do this book comparing these two cities, Brasilia and Chandigarh. Chandigarh, slightly older, um, but <coughs> both around the same time, uh, built with this sort of yeah, idea of uh, nation building. Uh, Brasilia really as a completely new capital by Oscar Niemeyer in the heart of Brazil. Um, uh, and uh, Chandigarh as uh, a capital of these three provinces in India. Um, and yeah, Brasilia is just fascinating with these large shapes kind of dropped everywhere in the city. The, the large uh, city plan, 
you saw that in that first aerial shot, um, you see a bit, yeah, the uh, idea of that uh, city planning, the sort of the bird with the open wings or the airplane, um, as Oscar Niemeyer described it, the central axis where all the uh, government buildings are, and then um, all the residential uh, buildings uh, uh, kind of spread out to the outskirts. Um, and then it's, uh, yeah, these kind of juxtapositions of these uh, big shapes and forms everywhere in the city and that kind of everyday life. Um, and I love to explore these things also like under all kind of different uh, weather conditions. Like I feel great architecture can look really great under any kind of condition. It's not so much like the perfect sunset or a dusk shot what you uh, see often in the architectural field. But um, uh, like also these buildings, like they're used in so such different ways, also depending on the time of the day, the weather, uh, the user, and what's happening there. So you really uh, try to spend a lot of time in these places, uh, see it throughout the days, uh, what people do there, um, uh, and uh, how uh, yeah, architecture, landscape, people, city, objects, um, uh, kind of all work in tandem, basically. Um, you see these uh, fantastic, yeah, large modernist facades, uh, how um, uh, Niemeyer sort of uh, idealized it, but then over time, like they're uh, sort of uh, all the air conditioner <laughs> units are popped in and it, it's not uh, the sort of ideal architect's image anymore, but you see also like that sort of notion of time uh, um, uh, changed. It's all this sort of, uh, yeah, a, a large concrete surfaces, a little nature there uh, inside the city immediately. Um, you're in the hot Brazilian sun, and then the, the sort of moments of uh, shade become also kind of places where people congregate, a shelter, uh, come together, and so on. So um, those kind of uh, users, usage uh, you try to show as well. And then it's Brazil, so there's always sort of a half-naked guy somewhere walking around, um, uh, even in the middle of these uh, government buildings. Um, and yeah, th these large, open, uh, monumental plazas, but no shade inside, and they're largely deserted, except for the pigeons and a few tourists and so. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, the, uh, the universities, uh, this is one of the universities there. Uh, they're always, uh, yeah, uh, beautiful active places where a lot is happening. Uh, uh, students uh, hanging out in different places. Uh, uh, the, the shading structures everywhere, the landscape um, and so on coming there together. And then also, like, I'm always drawn to sort of these uh, 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 places on the periphery of these uh, sort of idealized uh, cities like this is more like the um, uh, yeah the self the informal kind of uh, uh, villages in the outskirts of Brasilia where yeah uh, the workers who usually power that city who built it who uh, uh, maintain it and so they live and it's often a complete contradiction of the sort of ideal idealized architect's image um, uh, and uh, purely built out of a uh, necessity. Um, here the residential quarters with like a small church in between um, uh, people uh, 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 um, yeah, enjoying their afternoons in a, a piece of shade or at the, at the water, at the lake and so on. And then seeing, uh, seeing it from above, that sort of aerial picture, that's for me always important to put it all in context and um, show it like, yeah, how, uh, how a, uh, a city like that functions, how the relationships between all these buildings work. And you see also like the massive traffic jams, like it was this, uh, yeah, idealized uh, moment of the 60s where, yeah, the, the new way of city building was all with uh, based on the uh, on the car, um, it's all these uh, big uh, multi-lane uh, uh, highways, 
uh, roundabouts uh, and so on, uh, places which you cannot really cross as a pedestrian and uh, yeah, a city which was, um, I think, uh, the idea was for 600,000 people and nowadays 2 million people live in it, so it's largely a kind of traffic jam, um, which you see in these kind of images as well. And then Chandigarh, um, which was uh, yeah, 10 years earlier uh, conceived uh, by Le Corbusier, um, with uh, many collaborators. A total different uh, culture, of course, but uh, yeah, uh, built with a kind of same idea of uh, like nation building uh, through um, uh, through architecture and these sort of big monuments everywhere in the city, which uh, like are really grown in uh, to the landscape, which kind of poke their head out everywhere. Um, but then it's um, uh, India, so yeah, people sort of really occupy every nook and corner of these places. Um, uh, like this is the government building, but you see that like the workers brushing their teeth there early in the morning, and like every part of life basically uh, uh, happens there and goes on any time of the day. Um, yeah, here in front of the Palace of Justice, like uh, one of the uh, uh, workers who's uh, renovating the street at the same time is doing his laundry, and like everything sort of happens at a uh, at a similar uh, intensity and a similar level uh, all the time. And uh, those kind of moments really fascinate me, and uh, to show like yeah how all these worlds kind of collide and work together. Um, yeah, and it's uh, like really that Indian culture which you feel kind of seeping through in uh, uh, in every moment uh, in in these buildings. People resting, uh, taking their time, working, uh, uh, recreating. Everything sort of happens at the same time, and uh, kind of in informal ways as well. Uh, this is where all the notaries and lawyers have their. Uh, little desks, uh, like in a shaded part, uh, in uh, um, uh, next to one of the government buildings. And there you uh, go, um, yeah, out on the street in the shade to have your um, uh, documents uh, uh, notarized. Yeah, it's like literally every nook and corner of a place like that is uh, being used, occupied. Uh, people live in it, uh, uh, have little shops in it, and so on. These are more the residential quarters in the outskirts, uh, which are very alive and uh, uh, people live in small spaces, so a lot of that life happens outside on the streets. And that's, uh, yeah, the park and the afternoon nap there in the, in the little piece of shade uh, in the middle of the summer and then the kind of endless bureaucracy uh, you have in India, uh, which, yeah, once you step into these offices, becomes kind of so apparent uh, and visible. And it's everywhere, yeah, that architecture, for me, uh, really has to play, in, uh, yeah, almost as a kind of background in its sort of story of everyday life. Um, and uh, yeah, when these places are really taken over by its users and used often in kind of different ways also than architects initially imagined, um, those are really fascinating moments to discover. Architecture school here, is this beautiful light filled spaces. Um, Yeah, and another project um, I did a couple of years ago with Michael Maltz, an architect from Los Angeles, um, was this book with a number of essays uh, from uh, architects, thinkers, writers uh, on Los Angeles. And um, uh, Michael had asked me to do a series on LA, uh, a total opposite, uh, sort of endless sprawl, of course, uh, where the car takes the center stage uh, but at the same time, a kind of for a photographer, 
uh, like uh, a fantastic place in terms of light and uh, strange moments and worlds really colliding everywhere. Sunset Boulevard, um, uh, places where people sell all kind of th different things on the streets, uh, the sort of commercial areas uh, where like advertising, uh, 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 shoe shiners, uh, regular public, everything kind of screams at you in different ways. And it's sort of very, uh, yeah, uh, abstract, non-designed, uh, unintentional spaces, which kind of uh, happen as leftover places from the city, where kind of all the infrastructure and uh, uh, air conditioning spaces and so on are uh, coming together, but uh, also like a city with a very particular patina because of yeah that that sprawl and the kind of endlessness uh, ness of it. Um, the parks uh, where, yeah, it's uh, often like the homeless people uh, uh, or the Hispanic people, the uh, uh, mariachis, uh, uh, the sort of more informal world of uh, LA kind of comes together uh, super lively, but in a very different way as like there's all these total different societies um, uh, um, in, in the city. And then uh, you're in Beverly Hills, uh, where yeah, the entrance of the house are like littered with cars and uh, the houses, everything is bigger and better than the next one. Um, and yeah, these moments uh, uh, on Hollywood uh, Boulevard, uh, yeah, where uh, again, like all these kind of worlds are colliding, uh, uh, tourists, uh, uh, and, uh, all the uh, sort of tourist traps, um, uh, dinosaur popping out, uh, the sign screaming for your attention, and you feel that kind of energy everywhere um, uh, in these kind of moments. And then, like in every in LA, you can be any anything, anyone, <laughs> uh, anything you can imagine, and like even the dogs have like their <laughs> their whole outfits there. Um, uh, There's the crystal church uh, where Jesus walks on the water, <laughs> uh, slightly supported um, in this kind of total abstract uh, uh, kind of background. Um, but then LA is also like a place with the most uh, biodiversity, like it's a climate where kind of anything grows, um, uh, uh, where a lot of migrants came from all over the world and people took uh, like uh, plants and seeds uh, and uh, roots of uh, of their uh, home places there. And so you have this kind of incredible biodiversity also of uh, plants, uh, trees, uh, and so on everywhere in the city. So it's a sort of a kind of, uh, yeah, uh, unless you really sort of look for it and start seeing it, uh, you think of LA as this sort of endless concrete environment, and but then there's these pockets of like uh, abundant green everywhere. The Venice Beach with its skaters and uh, uh, surfboarders and so on. And then kind of the infrastructure which is like intertwined so much everywhere in the city, like a city which was also largely built on oil, uh, the oil uh, refineries uh, being everywhere, these uh, oil pumps still like everywhere, even like in residential neighborhoods, uh, people walking their dogs, but at the same time, you have these oil pumps uh, like next door, uh, still working, pumping oil out of the ground there. Um, or like here in the middle of a, a school playground, like there's another one of these oil pumps, but nicely kind of uh, uh, hidden out of sight in a, a kind of drawing uh, or so, but like these different worlds are, yeah, uh, very close to each other in that city. And of course it's proud America everywhere. <laughs> um, 
and yeah, again, in that kind of aerial uh, overview, like you really start to see these relations with all the, the different parts of the city, uh, like the, uh, the, uh, how it's all based on the car, this sort of endless highways, endless overpasses, and so on. Um, uh, and yeah, a very particular uh, place, of course. Sort of this endless concrete uh, with the green popping out, uh, which is really, yeah, for me, uh, something uh, particular to Los Angeles. And then underneath these highways and overpasses, there's another kind of life happening, uh, mainly the homeless people uh, who set up shop there um, and a, a sort of, yeah, these juxtapositions of scale uh, and personal moments in these places. And in the outskirts of LA, you have these massive infrastructural parts, uh, these huge holding basins for uh, rainwater full of, uh, uh, as in, uh, which yeah is kind of um, is kind of infrastructure which is maybe used once every couple of years when there's a massive rain coming in to uh, avoid a flooding of the city. And then there's these other kind of infrastructural elements throughout the city, like uh, all the power lines which run through the city. That's another kind of green uh, uh, band uh, throughout the city. Uh, like you cannot build uh, immediately underneath these power lines, so they become nurseries, little parks, and so. So that's suddenly like these sort of green uh, snaking areas uh, all the way through the uh, city. So there's these very particular moments everywhere. Um, then uh, with Manuel Hertz, uh, architect from uh, Switzerland, uh, we started a couple years ago to look at modernism in Africa. Africa has been always uh, a place also uh, where I try to, uh, which I try to visit uh, different places on the continent a couple times a year, working with younger African architects who do um, uh, noteworthy projects there on the continent but also looking at these uh, uh, modernist structures, which is always um, uh, fascinating in that part of the world. Uh, with Manuel, we focused uh, here on uh, uh, four or five countries uh, in Africa, which were all in a very particular moment of change. Like it was uh, uh, around their independence, uh, uh, also like uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, mainly where these countries yeah, became independent and as kind of nation building, kind of in the idea of like a Brazilian Chandigarh uh, hired mainly foreign architects at that time, which is quite particular, but um, architects to uh, design like their, their capital buildings, their government buildings, uh, huge schools, universities, and so on, uh, big markets and so. So in that time also like for these architects, uh, th yeah, there was a kind of wide open field uh, for experimentation in these kind of places. Um, nowadays these places are uh, often kind of neglected, uh, half forgotten, but at the same time still, yeah, are very much part of the city, but often like uh, under poor maintenance and so. Um, uh, but they were never really documented, so we set out to uh, make this book uh, on African modernism, uh, which came out a couple of years ago, uh, looking at these uh, uh, countries and how, uh, how they changed uh, through that, uh, those kind of large modernist ideas uh, in that time. This is a series from Lagos, um, which is not included in that first volume. We're just finishing a second volume, which is mainly focused on uh, Nigeria, um, where Lagos plays a big role in there. Uh, there's fantastic examples of architecture there also. And what I really like also, like uh, people are dressed uh, fantastically. The architecture kind of mimics that in, in different ways. And it's like incredibly colorful and vibrant and uh, Lagos with its uh, sort of energy and uh, power there of the people like uh, is, a, is a fascinating place to document. And like I, f I feel in places like that, it's also urgent to, uh, yeah, uh, 
make a kind of document on how these structures fare in this uh, day and age. Like uh, a lot of these countries are under big changes at the moment. Um, also with uh, China coming in, uh, there uh, there's a huge upgrading of these cities at the moment going on. Uh, uh, people have little respect for <laughs> that part of history. Um, so a lot of these buildings, like they're quickly seen as like yeah, uh, uh, not being maintained well. Uh, uh, so let's demolish it and let's put a shiny new glass tower in, in front of it. At the same time, like these buildings were built in a time where technology was not so abundant there yet, electricity and so on, absolutely not. So um, they were they all uh, yeah were for that time very uh, new ideas on natural ventilation, um, uh, making a building work with as little technology basically as possible. Uh, whereas today, like everything can be shipped and brought in from anywhere, but also still, yeah, um, uh, the technology often fails, and then you're in a climate like that where you're suddenly stuck in a glass building without any ventilation or air conditioning. So I'm not sure if it's not better to also look at these old examples um, and uh, maybe upgrade them and use them in different ways than just demolish it and. Uh, put uh, yeah, all the sort of new uh, modern glass stuff in. And they're fantastic examples of architecture and uh, experimentation in that time from uh, architects from all over the world. This is this uh, large university campus in Ife, uh, about a three hour drive outside Lagos in the north, done by an Israeli architect. Um, and yet, yeah, uh, my commissioned work usually for architects um, is this newer building, but um, I always, uh, yeah, I choose my projects also very much on like where these buildings are. You try to tell a story why that building is in a particular place and not somewhere else, uh, why it has to be there, that kind of use, uh, the kind of context and so on. So for me, it's that aerial perspective is always important to show it in its context and often the building itself becomes like a tiny part of the image and you try to tell that story like how, how a city around it grew and why a building is in that place, why it's designed in that way and sometimes the absurdities of a place like here Dubai with the Burj Khalifa, the tallest tower in the world but then you see this yeah, wide open kind of a desert landscape uh, with one and two story buildings and this one row with a few high rises and you see also kind of the absurdity of that place. Doha, Qatar here, Chicago. Um, uh, so yeah, you try to, um, it's always kind of this zooming in and zooming out from this personal moments of how people use these kind of places to these kind of large overviews where yeah, you really put it into context. And Chicago, for instance, is this place we all imagine with yeah, the uh, great modernist towers and so on, but seeing it from far away and from above, you see that it's also actually yeah, uh, a small part where that's really happening. And if you look at the average, uh, uh, building height in Chicago, I think overall over the whole city is just two stories tall. Uh, Sao Paulo with the Copan building, uh, Oscar Niemeyer there in the middle. Again, a kind of very particular patina over the whole city. Most of these buildings which are very light and uh, white uh, uh, painted. Los Angeles at night where the streets are yeah, uh, becoming these kind of lifelines through the city uh, because of the light of the cars and the street lights. Or Miami here, and then seeing it from above, this is like from a very high up. Um, yeah, you see how the city is literally sitting just inches above the water and uh, yeah, with the sea level rise, especially in these kind of places, which are very difficult to protect. Uh, you can't imagine what's what's going to happen there in the next uh, 
couple of decades. And at the same time, there's so much construction happening there everywhere. Um, but like these kind of views put that really into context. This is a series I'm currently working on, uh, on Houston, uh, Texas. Um, even a more car-centric place than Los Angeles. Um, and uh, this kind of immense infrastructure in the outskirts uh, uh, on the bay there uh, of, for oil refineries. Um, and yeah, the proximity of people living next to uh, that kind of industrial uh, uh, part of uh, Houston, um, its infrastructure. And then uh, sort of the endless 20 lane highways which sort of crawl through uh, through the city as huge bands of uh, cars going through. Um, New York, a place which I, uh, yeah, I lived for a long time and uh, photographed it under many different conditions, photographed it from the air many times. And then um, I was there uh, for another job. I just landed uh, the day before for a, a, a job for Herzog and de Meuron out in Long Island. And then uh, this was 10 years ago, uh, October 2012, when there was this big uh, superstorm, as they called it, um, uh, over the city, which knocked out the power of uh, more than half of New York for uh, six days. And yeah, I was stuck there also in my hotel uh, on the eighth floor, uh, walking up and down, and no electricity anywhere. And you think, like, how can you? Uh, uh, document and show this sort of unique moment that like power which is also because something kind of invisible at night all the streets everything becomes dark so um i was lucky like nothing really worked there in the city um, uh, so i knew a few pilots around the city but no one could really fly there and then because of this job i had for Herzog and de Meuron out in Long Island. I had already chartered a pilot there for, for that project. Um, I called him up and he said, yeah, sure, come over. And uh, so I drove over there and we flew back to the city at night. And th that was really the kind of moment where you saw that juxtaposition of the parts of the city with electricity uh, and that complete black uh, uh, sort of ink dot uh, in the rest. Uh, uh, of the city, a city for six days without electricity. Um, I showed it to an editor of a New York magazine. Uh, they put it immediately on the cover of New York magazine, uh, which came out on the day that the power was restored and that became a kind of uh, viral image uh, 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 yeah, showing New York in its very particular moment and became almost a kind of metaphor of what uh, yeah, uh, these uh, cities are up to with um, uh, climate change, uh, where uh, these kind of events uh, become more uh, uh, and more happening everywhere. Um, Kyoto, with its sort of incredible pixelation of like uh, every parcel and lot which has been divided and divided and divided over centuries, uh, but then you still see this like the large royal uh, palaces and gardens as these sort of super blocks in the in the middle of the city. And Tokyo kind of really formed and shaped by its waterways um, uh, which became highways, overground, underground and sort of completely organic way uh, a city grew there. Tokyo as well. And then like here we're in Africa, uh, in, um, in Nairobi, in the outskirts of Nairobi. Uh, Kibera, one of the largest slums of uh, Africa. Um, a completely self-built uh, community. Um, and yes, yeah, seeing it from above, it's just almost this continuous uh, roof of corrugated steel with small alleyways and so on in between, completely unplanned, uh, built by uh, the people themselves. And completely organic in a way and yeah you can see also like how cities yeah uh, with with a few centuries in between kind of grow like that and transform from uh, unplanned uh, uh, built structures out of necessity until like uh, really 
uh, uh, city planning and so on. Here we're in Caracas, Venezuela, um, also a place where 70% of the population lives in self-built structures all around uh, the city. Like you have these hills um, which are difficult to build on, um, but like they're completely draped by uh, the self-built uh, structures everywhere. Kind of like fingers going out into the city. And this is a book I recently finished with uh, Francis Carey, uh, architect from Burkina Faso. He won the Pritzker Prize uh, last year. Um, uh, he was born uh, in Burkina Faso, has his practice nowadays in Berlin, but still works a lot also on the African continent. Um, I've been working with him for many years. And um, uh, I'm always fascinated also by that context um, and the self-built uh, structures, the buildings really out of necessity, out of materials from from that place. Um, yeah, how you can build things with total minimal uh, materials. So I proposed him to uh, do a trip together to three places in the south of Burkina Faso, which all have very uh, particular buildings and building met mythologies. Um, this is Tjebele. Um, uh, a, s a small village uh, which was established almost 600 years ago already um, with all these buildings uh, yeah, made out of mud. Of course, they're constantly uh, rebuilt and refinished and so on. But um, uh, most of these structures have these beautiful um, uh, drawings on the walls, um, uh, patterns which get renewed every year after the rainy season, um, often a part of the building kind of washes away during the rainy seasons there. And then there's this whole ceremony of replastering them and um, making these drawings again over these buildings and uh, drawings which almost mimic like uh, their clothing and their patterns they use in everyday life. And I'm really fascinated by these kind of ideas of like, yeah, how you build uh, these buildings with total minimal materials like all the materials basically come right out of the ground there in front of you. Um, uh, floors, uh, uh, objects, uh, furniture, walls, ceilings, everything is kind of the similar material completely built by hand um, with uh, total minimal resources. Um, these houses are built in such a way, like this is the front door. The front doors are basically this tall. Uh, you have to kind of crawl through, uh, crawl over uh, a small edge inside, and then you enter these homes, which are, yeah, for when you enter them, the first five minutes, they're pitch black, basically, from the inside. So the only light comes through that opening, but it's partly, partially blocked. And it was also a way to protect these places. So um, uh, if you live there, you're inside, you, uh, there's this kind of small opening uh, of light. Uh, um, so you kind of see everything what's happening outside, kind of projected almost like a camera obscura on the back wall. So if, you see, uh, if someone uh, walks towards your house, you'll, you'll see that as a shadow kind of on the back wall. Uh, you see someone is approaching. Uh, people crawl in. If you wouldn't be long there, uh, the owner of the building stands there behind and you ushers you out or gives you a knock on your head. Um, but uh, that was a kind of way of protecting that place, of course, also. Uh, you come inside this completely a dark space where your eyes have to adapt for a couple of minutes. And then after a couple of minutes, that sort of whole interior space starts to reveal itself. Um, uh, the objects in there, uh, uh, the places where people uh, cook, live, uh, sleep, and so on, um, and how everything is kind of yeah uh, created out of that uh, same material. This is kind of the kitchen with the stones where they grind uh, grains and so on. And also at night, these places become completely dark. There's no electricity, so the only light is basically from a small fire burning or a torch uh, someone carries with them. And um, this last project I wanted to show you is a juxtaposition of two uh, complete opposite places, um, but 
also kind of very similar. Um, last uh, um, spring, uh, the American Academy in Rome called me um, if I could do a, sh a show there, um, like early fall, like uh, uh, pretty soon. Um, uh, but yeah, like they're based in Rome, and they said, like, yeah, Italians still love to see something made in Italy. Uh, so, do you have any subjects <laughs> you really shot in Italy? I said, no, not really. Um, but um, uh, w when they were calling me, I was actually just in Las Vegas, kind of standing there in front of <laughs> uh, <laughs> the the uh, Colosseum and the Caesar's Palace and everything. So I said, like, can we do something with that kind of strange juxtaposition? And then we uh, remembered that it was actually 50 years ago that Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi um, wrote uh, Learning from Las Vegas, which started at the American Academy in Rome uh, when they were uh, 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 in residence there, and which kind of made that case of yeah, uh, Las Vegas being kind of the modern day equivalent to Rome in its kind of pompousness, uh, exuberance, uh, and so on. So we decided to uh, look at these two places 50 years later after uh, Denise and Robert and see how that has changed. Of course, Las Vegas completely changed uh, in these last 50 years. There's hardly anything you can recognize from uh, the original book there. And everything, yeah, coming up, changing uh, all the time. Um, uh, of course, all, always kind of these hospitality structures. They have a very short lifespan. Everything is built, yeah, uh, basically like a theater set. Um, uh, it's a super thin skin and veil, basically, around these structures, which is fine for a couple of years, but then gets replaced with something even bigger and uh, more uh, outrageous in a way. And it's, of course, like these absurd moments you find everywhere. Um, uh, yeah, uh, crashing into each other, scales which are uh, completely uh, incoherent, out of scale, and so on. And everything is just this kind of environment for yeah, this endless uh, 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 machines uh, in there. And yeah, these places are getting bigger and bigger, so like it has to be filled with more and more stuff and patterns and so on, and it becomes. Yeah, this sort of endless repetition of uh, of patterns inside, uh, on and on and on, um, and uh, yeah, you feel sometimes like you're almost in a computer game, kind of walking around. And then, of course, there's everywhere the references to uh, uh, yeah, uh, to Italy, to France, to uh, any other kind of place in the world, but with the sort of modern day convenience of yeah. You can plug in your USB <laughs> stick uh, to charge your phone and so on. And then, yeah, it's all these completely interior worlds. Uh, here you uh, think you're in Venice, but it's only a uh, ground floor shopping. Everything above is uh, just decor. Um, there's a little gondola and a little canal where you can float through uh, uh, some clouds Painted, painted on the ceilings and so on. And then, yeah, seeing it from above, like this complete compression of like all this world screaming for attention, the super thin uh, veneer basically of every project, like everything has just this tiny wrap around of uh, yeah, an, a facade uh, which hides uh, yeah everything else inside. It's kind of scaleless, like it could be a model, it could be real. Uh, it's hard to see uh, and hard to say uh, what you're really looking at. All these worlds like really compressed and uh, coming up against each other. And uh, yeah, like only the surfaces which you immediately see are treated. The rest is totally utilitarian uh, space. And like here there's a place where you come out and where this kind of uh, decor set uh, like pasted <laughs> against yeah just a large box for like uh, um, uh, utilities uh, parking garage air conditioners and so on and uh, that's sort of uh, that's little decor uh, makes you 
think that you're still in um, uh, in Italy or France or wherever. But uh, going uh, further away from the strip, you see kind of the raunchy uh, background of uh, Las Vegas and the sort of no man's land, uh, the place in the middle of the desert uh, with sort of all the unfinished spaces, uh, the parking lots, the infrastructure which uh, powers it all, and so on, and sort of that banality of, of everything else. Places where the homeless live under the, uh, in the shade of the highways and the st uh, overhead structures and so on. And again here, from above, you see that little strip um, uh, uh, called the strip where everything <laughs> kind of is happening and the sort of endless continuity of the rest of the city there. Here the Trump Tower uh, clad it in gold like in this sort of endless concrete jungle and like kind of the only color popping out really is that is that gold. feels almost like you're looking at that kind of computer chip from above and these connections and the, uh, um, how that city is uh, built. The outskirts of the city with its um, residential neighborhoods. And then, um, yeah, there's the large golf courses uh, in the middle of the desert. And then here we are in Rome, uh, of course, a uh, in uh, ways a complete opposite, but you see at the same time also uh, a lot of sim similarities. Um, of course, uh, yeah, grown over uh, hundreds and over thousands of years. Here we have the Vatican, uh, all these layers of time uh, really compressed in these kind of aerial pictures where you see the relationship between the plazas, the monuments, the buildings, uh, and so on. Um, but sometimes also kind of similar flatness of like, yeah, uh, uh, putting in more and more uh, of that kind of exuberance and, uh, and so on. I was here last summer at, in the middle of a heat wave with the masses of tourists uh, walking through everything everyone dripping of sweat and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, also there, of course, you see uh, a big similarity between uh, that kind of endless tourism in Las Vegas and Rome, which is also uh, reduced a lot to that uh, tourism aspect. Here you're like in the basement of uh, the Vatican in the uh, food and beverage section where like all the walls are kind of, yeah, you also are, uh, could be anywhere in the world. Um, uh, and the difference between Las Vegas or Rome becomes sometimes uh, very uh, small. Um, the Trevi Fountain, uh, also like here seeing it from above, like you see the similarities between a place like Las Vegas and Rome as well. Like the Trevi Fountain is not much different than that little fake wall basically <laughs> put in front of these uh, large boxes in Las Vegas, um, like a, a, a small facade uh, with the fountain w which attracts everyone, but uh, just in the back is uh, a kind of a, a normal uh, structure uh, built. And then kind of the masses of tourists, all the dripping sweat, the water, everything is sort of the ice cream and <laughs> everything kind of comes out of these, uh, these images, I feel. People resting uh, on uh, all the old parts and structure in, inside the city. Yeah, then you see that, yeah, we all have kind of similar aspirations uh, of place making, building, uh, um, uh, uh, recreation and so on. Uh, so it's, it's fascinating always to see these and at the same time large differences, but also like the same aspirations and uh, what people try to achieve in different places of the world. Like Rome where you can't do any uh, outdoor advertising really, uh, um, except 
when you're a uh, Valentino and you can rent a full Spanish steps to uh, build a giant fashion show uh, with its own security and so on uh, uh, in front of it. Or when you have an old building and you need to renovate the facade, you put a, a, a big a scaffolding up and that's the place where you can put advertising on. And then often, often these renovations take years, uh, so to say, and that's your place of income and revenue for, for a building like that. Again, like sometimes difficult to see like what's real in the building and what's fake and uh, a, a place which they're renovating where, yeah, uh, in the, under the fake facade, uh, the kind of um, uh, the grass is growing <laughs> underneath. And a very particular Rome light and Rome patina in colors, um, especially during the sunset. Uh, which is so striking for that city. And then the complete opposite, of course, from Las Vegas, where it feels uh, yeah, this cold, technocratic uh, environment, which is just becoming bigger and bigger. And um, yeah, uh, like that scale, which has to be uh, become larger and larger uh, uh, everywhere. Like you, you see these kind of patterns, like it becomes like you're walking in a, in, a, in a computer game where all these patterns are kind of mapped endlessly, like in the metaverse or so, becoming kind of real in these kind of places. And that's really fascinating to see how uh, that kind of jump in scale is happening now in many places of the world. Like, and that kind of convergence of the digital space, the real space, and so on. Like, uh, how all the, uh, how everyone is talking about, uh, like, the metaverse and the sort of virtual spaces. Like, here they're still kind of included in, like, a physical building, but whole buildings become, like, this kind of LED um, uh, projection uh, walls and ceilings where a kind of total different world can be uh, projected um, uh, inside the building. And then, yeah, it's a small step just to put your goggles on and you'd be, you'll be transported to a kind of different uh, place. And like now in Las Vegas, they're building this massive new uh, orb, which is basically just this ball, um, uh, apparently to a cost of uh, over a billion and a half dollars. Um, but it's basically this giant orb aligned from outside and inside with LEDs where basically any kind of space can be projected and you could be anywhere. So you're questioning yourself also like, why do I really have to go to Las Vegas or can you put it all on glasses and do we need that kind of space uh, anymore? So um, that was, yeah, for me a fascinating discovery to see these two places together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for that presentation. Um, I'm sure we have uh, a lot of questions in the audience. Uh, I'm going to start with, I guess, we can kind of have your work divided into two aspects. This, these are your personal projects. You, you showed a lot of that, but you also have your commissioned work, and then there's some blending in between as well. And uh, from, from what I saw uh, through all these projects is you, you don't seem to judge that much. And uh, or I, I'd like to ask, like, should we see a lot of criticism of not only the architecture, the urban planning, or maybe the socioeconomic conditions in your photographs, or is that something that you leave to others? Well, I think like there's there's criticism, but like a criticism also excludes quickly a lot of things. So uh, I want to be open, and I'm totally fascinated also by all these different places and these kind of juxtapositions and being one day in rural Africa, uh, people building things uh, out of the complete minimal resources and materials and out of complete necessity and it's sort of total extremities like Las Vegas. So uh, I think it's important to show it all and um, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm very grateful and privileged to, to be able to see all this and sort of uh, visualize it with, with a kind of similar intent. Um, so, um, uh, like, uh, there 
there's a clear selection in kind of projects I would take on from architects and others, which I uh, probably won't. Uh, um, uh, but like, as long as I can tell that kind of other story on like uh, architecture and why it's in a particular place, how it's used, um, uh, there can be a very wide range of uh, circumstances. Yeah. Because I guess on the other end of the spectrum, when, when there is maybe that, uh, I'm really interested how it's, you are not an architect, but you work with architects. And uh, generally, they could be, they, they can be quite dominating and controlling in how their work is not only, uh, you know, built, but also presented. So uh, is that something that you've had to deal with before, you know, them kind of maneuvering you in something that that you kind of might have been not as happy about or do you get free reign yeah. you just you, you take a job and then you say I get to do whatever I want yeah no I've been lucky to work with uh, architects who gave me uh, always complete freedom to discover a place and that's for me also like a prerequisite to take something on that like I like I should be able to see also the backside of the architecture, the things which an architect maybe um, hasn't intended um, uh, usage, which um, is is maybe not as an architect had imagined it. And I feel also like an architect, uh, they worked with a project for five years, eight years, sometimes 15 years or longer. And like they're so set with uh, their I first ideas of like how a pro project should look. Uh, that's as often, also very refreshing to have a kind of a different eye on it and um, I think also like the sort of constant traveling I do and uh, jumping from very different worlds all the time like keeps you very open to like the kind of nuances of a place and particularities of a place uh, which you try to bring out in these projects. Yeah, because um, from what we, we saw, you, you've been you know all over the world. Maybe just a very practical question: What does your typical week look like? Like, do you ever get to spend two nights in the same place, or is it? It depends. Um, yeah, we, we, like we have a young family, two kids, uh, which we pre-COVID we took them basically everywhere <laughs> all the time. So it was like a whole traveling circus always <laughs> with an au pair and uh, two kids and going from yeah, place to place, which was uh, a fascinating upbringing, I think, for, for especially for the oldest who was most uh, into that. And COVID, of course, changed that a little bit, which uh, made the traveling part uh, much more complicated. So at that time, Amsterdam was a bit more a base. Nowadays, we're a bit more in the US. Uh, uh, we still try to take the kids as much as possible, but. Um, the whole traveling experience has been uh, quite different these days. So um, you try to spend yeah, uh, times off and on uh, uh, together and then uh, traveling at the moment often when I'm traveling alone, it's kind of very full back to back. Uh, you're every day, another place, another hotel and so on. It depends. And then there's these kind of projects um, uh, the longer term projects, uh, these projects on cities where you try to stay for for a week, two weeks uh, in a place uh, which we us usually try to do all together and really kind of discover a place in a different way. So there's kind of all levels, yeah. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I think um, we have some microphones going around, so please don't hesitate to ask on right here. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I'd like to ask uh, about how you incorporate people into the into the photos. I like it a lot, and it seems to me that they behave like uh, you are not there at all. They are not acting for a camera. So I'd like to ask, uh, what's your trick on that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's 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 always a fine line you walk as a photographer, like in a way, like you want to be present, you want to make sure people sort of understand that you're there and that you can photograph them, but you also try to be kind of fly on the wall and see what people do there. And uh, so it's also often spending a bit of time on the site uh, where people kind of get comfortable with you and kind of forget that you're really there. Um, uh, you 
uh, and then it's yeah trying to find those moments where something particular happens uh, uh, you uh, uh, people behave in a specific way, do things. Um, it's it's also like really those moments. Sometimes it it happens like the moment you walk in that you see something and you start photographing, and later on you start talking with people in a place. Uh, it's it it it's it's a very intuitive sort of way of working. Always, uh, it's hard to say that there's kind of one recipe uh, which fits all, but um, yeah. Uh, the trying to be kind of as invisible as possible as a photographer. And that's also like, yeah, my background as a documentary photographer, like you try to work uh, with a small camera, a small setup. Uh, I don't work with assistants or coming in with all crew or so, so everything is handheld. Uh, and uh, uh, that yeah, makes you also able to yeah, really react and be in that moment and see what's happening there. Yeah. So maybe, maybe that's something that we can uh, focus on a little bit because I'm sure people are interested in with you traveling all the time, you probably don't can't have a big setup. So what is your are you like are you just a handheld yeah. camera, no flashes, no assistance? Is that is that how you work? No, you you work with the existing light. I feel like with architecture, it's also like an architect has a clear intention, of course, of the light and uh, conditions in a space. So um, uh, it's it's a small setup of uh, a shoulder bag with uh, three uh, basic lenses, uh, four basic lenses. Uh, a camera body, uh, most of it uh, handheld. As long as you can shoot handheld, of course, there's conditions when it gets really dark, where you uh, try to make that kind of balance of uh, what uh, quality versus uh, being there in the moment versus having a heavier setup with a tripod. For instance, the, that also that technology is sort of yeah uh, going forward. So quickly like these pictures I showed from Burkina Faso um, that uh, is this book um, uh, an exhibition which is also still traveling uh, it's called Momentum of Light uh, which we made out of that project with Francis Curie um, so it's uh, really about this um, uh, stark difference of these interior spaces and exterior spaces and it's a difficult place to photograph like we couldn't be there long in each place uh, also because of security concerns and so on. So you try to be there as invisible and as light as possible uh, and use the technology kind of to the fullest extent. So that's also like with cameras nowadays, like which are super sensitive where you can shoot in that kind of near darkness, still handheld and with a very light setup and not being really present there as a photographer with all his equipment and so on. So yeah, uh, also like, yeah, you try to use the technology in its full extent um, uh, to uh, get these kind of results. Or for instance, the picture of New York was also like at, at such a moment. Um, I remember that like shortly before I took that picture, maybe like two weeks before uh, or so, Canon came out with its newest flagship camera at that time, uh, the 1D X Mark, I don't know, if, if, uh, something like that. It was 2012. And I flew to New York, um, and that was the first camera at that moment, which like really where you could really push that sensitivity to the max. So it was also like a coincidence that I had that technology in hand. There was this blackout moment where you tried to take a picture without any light from a moving, vibrating helicopter. You tried to push it to the full extent. And yeah, being there, uh, hanging in, out of that helicopter over the city, yeah, you take just a shitload of pictures. I think I came back probably with four or five thousand pictures, just keeping your hand on the shutter, uh, pushing it all in terms of sensitivity and a uh, shutter and so. And out of uh, all these pictures, there's uh, maybe a handful which are completely sharp and where you're right in that moment, and everything comes together. So it's often also like yeah, pushing. Uh, technology, ideas, uh, everything uh, to yeah uh, come to a result. Do we have any other questions uh, from the audience? I'm sure you do.
There we go. Hi. Uh, since you are talking about the helicopter, I would like to ask, uh, how does it feel to shoot in a helicopter? Can you talk a bit more about it? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I tend to uh, do for most projects I photograph, like I find that context and putting it in in that urban setting or a landscape setting, I find it always important. And like architects are always asking for just their building and of course their details and so they're interested in. But um, yeah, zooming out and showing that larger context and telling that story why it's there, I find it's important. So usually towards the end of uh, the, the days uh, I'm spending around the place, I tend to uh, get a helicopter to photograph it from the air. And that's really a moment where, yeah, you can uh, kind of compose your image in a way, like you work in close tandem with, uh, with the pilot. Uh, so um, you have some ideas uh, which you plan out beforehand, kind of uh, with uh, Google Maps, uh, 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 satellite imagery, and so to uh, think of like what, what could work for the building, its location, its direction, a, a foreground, a background, what do you want to show, what time of the day you're flying uh, to make the light ideal to bring out uh, parts of the building. Um, so and then like yeah, being up there in space and you work with the pilot, you can direct them very specifically to a point in that way, kind of almost composing your image of like you, uh, uh, yeah, uh, playing with what what's in the background, how f how close you are to it, how far, uh, what effect your lens has on these kind of things. Uh, and in that way, like yeah, where you are as a photographer, it's basically. I do the same on, on the ground. You walk around a lot and you see it from different places. Uh, you work with people in the foreground. You always have a kind of third eye looking for what's, what else is happening there. So you position yourself in a place where kind of all these elements start to make sense and you start to tell a story on a place. So uh, with a, working with a pilot together, you can do that kind of in 3D space, which is even more interesting, I find. Uh, so that's yeah, always a, uh, a fun part of, of it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yep. Uh, can I connect to that question? Like uh, how it is? Uh, is it more like uh, you, have, you observe how does it look like uh, from the top and choosing uh, like even what to photograph? after the research you, you talked uh, from the Google Earth? Or uh, do you think now when are, for example, big drones uh, that can carry a big camera, is it possible uh, to do it even with that? Or like, is it essential to be above? It, it depends. Like, it depends a little bit on the scale of the project and what you want to say uh, with it. Um, I, I do have a drone also these days, and it's a, it's a really uh, handy tool to uh, scout out the project and see also like how it f uh, fits a bit but I feel still with the drones um, uh, yeah you uh, like often the projects I shoot are also like larger kind of on a city level where as with the drone like you cannot be that high or that far away and um, so you're uh, quite limited actually in what uh, how what you can shoot and what my frustration often with drones is, although that's changing now a little bit, um, but most drones uh, are just a bit too wide angle and kind of too exaggerated views. Um, uh, and uh, the quality is still not completely up to what you do with the rest of the camera for most uh, uh, pictures. It's it's okay and for a magazine and so, but if you just get that shot, uh, you really want to blow up for an exhibition or so, you still see the difference in quality. So in the end, um, yeah, the kind of territory you can cover in an hour, two hours with a helicopter versus what you can do with a drone uh, is, is totally different. And then, um, yeah, it's a lot more fun to be behind the camera than <laughs> just to <laughs> look at the little screen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the third row. Ha, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm following it with total fascination <laughs> what's happening there. Uh, I, I haven't found a way like where I could incorporate it in my own practice in a way. But uh, of course, it's it's totally fascinating to see that uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, stock the computer with billions of images, and the computer starts to create uh, work out of that. Um, uh, it's hard to say much more. Like uh, for me, like I, I don't see how I would incorporate it in my practice. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, I don't think so. Like there's a kind. I I feel like uh, um, reality is always uh, much more fascinating and <laughs> un, uh, uh, unscripted, and uh, you you come to discoveries. Uh, Often more than sitting behind the computer. I don't know. Like, I, I don't f feel threatened myself. I, 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 f I think there will be, uh, uh, of course, a big, uh, yeah, a push uh, uh, by a lot of clients who think it it might be easier to get an AI image uh, and put something together there. But I think it's also two different worlds. Uh, um, and like, there's a great parts of it, um, if maybe for the edit, editing process, where like yeah, uh, you can select parts of your picture, delete it, and the AI sort of <laughs> uh, 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 fills it in, um, and so on. But uh, yeah, there's a little of reality uh, happening there anymore. Of course, anything can, uh, can be created. Perfect. I think we have time for a uh, question up there. And then uh, we do want to do a little uh, tour uh, of the exhibition with Ivan as well. So uh, yeah, maybe one last question. Uh, thank you. I have one technical question, uh, like how much of post-processing are you do on your photos, or is it all in camera? And one, when you're documenting the construction of the building, uh, do you pick when you uh, was it the site, or is it the architect who picks what time she, uh, he wants the, the building to be photographed? Thank you. Um, uh, so, yeah, w w uh, with those visits, I, I'm, I, I usually pick it uh, completely myself. I can be, um, uh, I, I choose to have complete freedom there. And, and uh, don't do it with an architect or like on its architect's specifications or short list. Like for me, these projects all should be also kind of a discovery in its own uh, of what you encounter there and what, what happens there. So um, of course, in the end, there's always, uh, yeah, if you do commissioned work, what an architect would select out of it uh, and which makes it out to the public. Um, versus uh, what your own selection is there, like that's uh, uh, often uh, it depends a little bit of uh, more collaboration, or it's more the architect who chooses, or sometimes more uh, yourself uh, who's choosing. So that kind of goes in all kind of different gradations. But my kind of criterion for a project to shoot is also that I could basically should be able to make uh, a little booklet out of everything. Like there should be enough material, enough discoveries, different views, different uses. Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, yeah, a kind of perspectives and discoveries in a place to make an interesting, like full kind of story of of a place. So um, there's you come back always with a lot of material, and then it is always a bit up to the architect. Uh, like. Uh, yeah, what what makes it out out in the public, uh, so to say? Sorry, now I forget your first question. Was it was about post processing? Oh yeah, post processing. yeah. No, I, I do as 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 little as possible. Basically, what you used to do before in the dark room, uh, a little bit of color correction, uh, the contrast, and so on. But uh, that's 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 about it. Um, uh, also, like you. 
uh, yeah, I try to work a lot with sort of the general press images coming in uh, newspapers and so on, and like they're completely allergic to any kind of editing or cleanup or uh, a beautification of, of the image. So, uh, and in the end, it's uh, again they're much more fun to be in the moment and photographing than to sit behind the computer and uh, 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 cleaning up others' mistakes. So, if if there are these kind of mistakes or unplanned moments or so like you try to incorporate it also in a way like almost in the composition uh, in in your story and so on uh, so um, uh, or like if it's sometimes of course you, you make decisions of like yeah uh, your point of view what you keep in an image or keep out uh, your uh, and so on uh, by highlighting or um, uh, disguising parts of a, of a, of a building uh, or a place, but um, uh, I do little in the computer, yeah. Um, thank you so much. This, I think, concludes our, our first part, although before we move uh, to the actual exhibition, I'd like to ask, because uh, compared to all these rather you know exotic places you visited, Prague, at least to us, because we live here, it might seem a little bit mundane. So maybe is there something that surprised you when you visited Prague? Or maybe also if you could talk a little bit about how you experienced that. You were here for, I think, seven days, right, last year. Uh, yeah. How was that and what surprised you the most? Yeah. No, I think, I, did, I don't know, that, that, that the mundane is like also very much in the eye of the beholder and like uh, it, if I have the same for Amsterdam, <laughs> like a place which I know uh, has the, um, uh, uh, on the back of my pocket, but it's like um, uh, you try to find like what makes it special place special and I think also in that sense like sort of the traveling and being constantly exposed to different places makes you acutely aware of yeah what makes that place uh, so different than another place and um, uh, yeah when I was here last summer it was for me the first time that I was in Prague it was long on my list to come but it somehow never happened and uh, and uh, like you know, sort of uh, the classic Prague images, uh, the historic uh, places, and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, then it's 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 also like that sort of curiosity which drives you all the time to uh, look for yeah the kind of unexpected uh, parts of a city, um, uh, how a city grew, and so on. Um, uh, and yeah, I will tell also more on that uh, during the walkthrough. But um, uh, yeah, like I think that that mundane and like so many places, like you're in in Brasilia or Chandigarh, and it's the same. The people there will say like, "What what are you looking at? These old buildings here? And, like, there's nothing to see here. Like, it it it, it happens everywhere and anywhere. And it's like uh, that's also like your task as a photographer to uh, uh, yeah, uh, bring a kind of extraordinary view to kind of the ordinary and the daily life. Um, and that's uh, also like yeah, the, uh, what drives me and what makes me go to all these places. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we can now uh, move to the next part. Um, if you want, there's some coffee over there. But uh, well, I think we can all move to the exhibition. And uh, Ivan will do a little walkthrough uh, about both the thematic um, aspects of the photographs and the exhibition itself. So thank you very much for coming. And, and please join us for the next part. Um, yeah, so this uh, this is my take on Prague uh, from uh, that first visit uh, last summer. Um, I was here at the end of the summer, uh, uh, my first time uh, being in the city. Uh, beautiful weather, still kind of end of summer, uh, people relaxing uh, in, in many different places, in the parks, uh, under trees and so on. Um, we started a bit with the idea uh, to look at Prague from kind of its the river's perspective. I had a feeling that it would bring me also like to more kind of uh, uh, unexpected places in the city. Um, 
uh, the river being always kind of a lifeline to a city, a kind of a reason why a city is built. And um, often a lot of the sort of industrial heritage uh, of a city which is around, uh, built around these kind of waterways. So that was kind of the start of the, of the ID. Um, I traveled kind of the river uh, from the outskirts, uh, the north to the south, um, the places where the city uh, uh, meets kind of nature, uh, the hills and so on, to like yeah, the center of Prague, uh, the bridges, uh, uh, all the way to the south, where it's, uh, uh, the city kind of disappears again into the nature. Um, yeah, I was here for a little over a week. Um, you try to use uh, uh, that time kind of to the full extent. You come back with a lot of images and from there you start to uh, make a selection process, make it usually smaller and smaller and uh, come to kind of that, uh, what is that story of Prague. But um, yeah, we decided in the end to show here on this uh, wall uh, a collection of uh, over 1200 uh, pictures uh, which I took during that week. They're completely randomized here, but uh, every picture has a little uh, data of where it was taken. Uh, like the cameras nowadays, they record, of, the, of course, the location, the GPS, the time and, uh, and day and so uh, when they were taken. And it gives a kind of overview and a kind of a patina of the city almost. Um, so yeah, the, the, the river was this sort of first idea and from there like uh, I was looking at uh, that kind of industrial uh, past, that industrial heritage, uh, uh, um, uh, like the factories in the outskirts, uh, how a lot of these places are, I feel like at the moment under a big transformation uh, from that kind of industrial past to like uh, a kind of gentrification uh, and so on. And what I was really struck by um, here in the city and the city planning, there's something uh, virtuous and grand uh, ab about the city planning and its history and like a place which has been little touched uh, uh, over the centuries and only sort of built upon and built upon. So you see kind of all these layers of history really uh, coming together. Um, uh, but then at the same time, there's a, a sort of uh, very laid back feel uh, on the city and uh, partly probably the time of the year, the kind of end of summer, but also kind, kind of the whole mentality of people and um, uh, uh, a kind of uh, very relaxed everyday life, which I try to capture in many different places from kind of, uh, yeah, uh, like the social housing uh, projects, which you see here, um, uh, all like, uh, yeah, also like, uh, what I found really particular here that a lot of the housing like has all these uh, this very specific color palette uh, everywhere like from the social housing to historic uh, houses and buildings like everything has a, l a lot of character and personality uh, these kind of buildings and so that was really something I tried to bring out uh, in many places of course there's kind of the the well-known uh, uh, plazas, the castle, uh, 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 sort of the open spaces in the city. Um, you try to uh, capture under different circumstances. But also, uh, yeah, the kind of industrial heritage, the waterworks, again, the, they're the kind of combination of uh, the city, the water, and how water played a, a big role in the development here of Prague. Um, we made here on this back wall, there's uh, little uh, kind of postcards you can take out and uh, can take home. So with uh, uh, some of the uh, pictures um, in, the, in the exhibition. So you move from this uh, wall with like the over 1200 pictures to a more curated selection of different themes uh, in the city uh, over here. Um, from, yeah, uh, again, like its history, infrastructure, uh, this place, like with the train station, which I found a very particular place where yes, you see also, like, kind of 
uh, old and newer Prague coming together and that kind of infrastructure point of transit where always a lot of unexpected things are happening. So those kind of uh, moments are always interesting uh, to, uh, to observe as a photographer. Yeah, to the river and the bridges and so on. Uh, it's kind of uh, modernist icons, the museums, uh, uh, the infrastructure, the new parts of Prague coming up uh, and so on. And then um, if we move over here, kind of the, uh, yeah, these sort of very personal moments uh, in and around the city, the small allotment gardens where you see people kind of making their own small utopias uh, on the few square meters in their gardens and so on. Uh, people um, uh, recreating next to the river, setting up a little camp. Um, uh, having lunch on their houseboats and so on. These sort of very particular personal moments, but uh, I felt still in these kind of moments there was a kind of personality of uh, Prague uh, coming out. And especially uh, with that kind of particular patina and color of the city uh, popping out everywhere. Um, here you see also some more of that kind of industrial relics or like the old swimming pools, the infrastructure, the bridges. Um, for a day I went around with uh, this uh, local artist, uh, uh, Epos, um, uh, who works also a lot with that context of the city and the kind of found objects. And so I went to visit with him um, at this uh, uh, woman uh, uh, she's homeless and he built with her uh, together uh, this uh, small uh, housing uh, uh, kind of cabin underneath um, uh, one of the viaducts where she's still living and she kind of made her own uh, small um, yeah, uh, universe there in a very kind of improbable place. So yeah, it's it's a lot like what is uh, what's also really struck me here in the city. Like uh, the, there's a lot of green and uh, the parks, the nature kind of coming out, and of course like on the outskirts of the uh, the city, what you see here, for instance, in the background, like uh, the outskirts where the river really meets the nature and is a very bucolic uh, landscape. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, nowadays also like uh, there, there's uh, places where a lot of the development is happening. And then towards the last kind of layer uh, coming through the show, uh, we're showing here uh, the large aerial uh, panoramas, uh, so to say. Um, at the very end of uh, my week here, uh, we spent uh, a bit over an hour in a helicopter over the city, kind of following the river, uh, showing uh, like the historic parts, the new parts, and like how it all comes together. And suddenly, they, yeah, this, these aerial shots, um, yeah, they really uh, show that proximity of all these places, the compression sometimes of like uh, how all these uh, different parts of the city coexist um, and come together. And uh, again, like that kind of patina over the city, I feel like really comes out uh, in these aerials. Here, like we're still in the outskirts, uh, where it's mainly green and infrastructure to like where you go more towards the city center, where that uh, city patina, the buildings really start to come out, uh, this uh, large socialist housing blocks uh, and so on. Are there any questions? <laughs> you, seem, you seem to have lots of, um, lots of passion for an acceptance for homeless people, for ugly stuff. Uh, can you still perceive quality in your life and are you looking for quality or don't you mind any longer? Um, no, like... Uh, um, I think like what what I'm really looking for also like what what makes a 
place special and different than other places. Like there's so much sameness, I feel like everywhere uh, in the built environment nowadays, all around the world. Like you see architects can basically order any kind of material from anywhere uh, coming in and build anything anywhere. And like I feel places like this, like you feel that kind of history still very much seeping through everywhere. Um, and which makes it unique for this time, that place. And uh, I think that's that's a big driver for me, what what's, uh, yeah, sparks my curiosity in places. Um, and uh, yeah, their uh, quality, I think that's also, that can be very different interpretations for different people like for some uh, person yeah that's apartment on fifth avenue in new york that's the way they have to live and that's that's their quality or for others it can be a kind of self-built uh, uh, place uh, under much um, uh, more dire circumstances but uh, i feel like if once that kind of personality and history and uh, a, a specificity to a place i think comes through and i can show that that's that's something which really sparks my interest uh, i'd like to ask how do you scout for the photos like for example if you just walk around and see what's there or if you pick landmarks and then then walk around or if you have any special like process like searching from images in google photos or <laughs> other servers like where there might be something interesting or what's yeah. like for a personal projects like that I yeah no like you rely of course on some uh, information and collaborations like of course, the people here from camp have been incredibly helpful in sort of guiding me uh, in a sort of first guidance to the city and show me different parts of the city. Uh, they came with some ideas, and like the, for after that, it's it's a very intuitive way of working. Like you go back to places, uh, you see what's happening there. Sometimes you think like, oh, that moment, th that's part of the city can be very interesting but maybe during the weekend when there's more people or an activity happening or so so it's a very intuitive way of yeah being there uh, for some time and uh, discovering a place not uh, it, and it's also different for every place uh, and sort of what you uh, what you encounter there and it was also nice that for like that day I went around with Epos, uh, the artist here, uh, who uh, looks at the very sort of, yeah, also the kind of the backside of the city and the kind of underrepresented parts of the city. Uh, so you, yeah, you try to incorporate a lot of different views always uh, of different people. Yeah. And uh, was there any particular moment, place, or or something that that uh, stuck with you in your mind if, if from Prague, <laughs> or or maybe is there any particular favorite picture of yours that you took here? Yeah, no, I think it's the richness of color here in Prague, uh, in buildings and personalities of people and so on. I think that's that really struck me and um, like there are places with uh, with that uh, uh, incorporation of color also, but that also like even the. Um, the socialist housing like has uh, has this colorful uh, uh, personality. That I think that was something which really struck me, uh, and like that that's that kind of patina which makes it very particular. And you see, like there's this history uh, in one part, but then at the same time, like uh, uh, that history is kind of treated in a kind of similar color pattern as also modern things. So. Uh, that was was very inspiring to see. Um, maybe I is it working? Uh, can I ask? Uh, we see there's around one thousand photos, like, and then we scaling down to almost like a one or ten photos uh, yeah. here at the screen. Is there any? Or do you have any? Or do you have any number? Where, where, you, where are you going to the location? How many photos you have to take? Is there like a? Okay, I took one thousand photos. Now I, I will be able to select, let's say, one hundred, because we, because you said at that presentation that you took five, almost five thousand photos from the helicopter. 
or I don't know, is there a ratio? Yeah. Possibly? No, it's hard to say. Like uh, that example for New York, for instance, that was purely out of technical necessity that you shoot so much because like 95% is probably blurred because of the, the conditions there. Um, in the end, like you're, uh, you try to be as concise as possible during the photography, uh, the actual photography process there. Um, uh, you see things, you work towards an ID, like when, when you get to a place to see what's happening, you, you try different angles, uh, uh, moments and so on. But you feel also like when you're photographing, oh, like now I have the shot, you sort of move on to a, another place. Um, here the idea was yeah, to show these aerials on the large screen because like I uh, usually try to show the aerials or in large prints or so. I thought here this screen is yeah, unique for this place and really brings out all the details and like there's so much to see in these aerials. Uh, they could even be shown much slower I think. Like there's a lot to discover all the time and the relationships between all the places uh, and so on which kind of disappear in a, in a small image. So I thought, yeah, there we can really use also the yeah, specificities of this place uh, for, uh, for showing the aerials there. How does the people accept that you, that, that you photograph them? Yeah, I think that's always a very cultural difference in different places, how, how easy it is to, f uh, to photograph people. Um, uh, here in Prague, I had no issues. I feel people all were sort of in their own <laughs> world and kind of hardly uh, saw the photographer. Uh, in other places in the world, it's often very different. So it depends on the place and, and, uh, and so on. But in that sense, it was really easy to photograph here. Yeah. Any other questions? So I have one, uh, yeah. if I can. Uh, uh, you said that like for a part of your journey was done by a bike or on bike, uh, and you said that you were quite comfortable actually like riding a bike in Prague. So I'm asking on the other side, is there any place that you felt quite scared like riding a bike in Prague? Because for me, that is something like I'm scared of most of the time. Yeah, like I'm from Amsterdam, so like yeah, you're always on a bike there. Um, but that's also part of like these kind of discoveries in cities. I tend to use any kind of transportation in these places to kind of discover it because I feel like with every mode of transportation and speed of transportation you kind of see and discover different things so you walk around uh, you bike around you go around by car by helicopter and so on so it's kind of like each speed of transportation like, yeah, lets you also discover different things um, uh, I thought a uh, Prague is really great to bike. Like uh, often the streets are are wide. There's like a, a large city planning. A lot of it is relatively flat. Or nowadays, like the electric bikes, it's also easy to go up uh, a small hill and so. So um, uh, it was was a great place to explore by bike. Uh, but there, there are a few places, like especially around the station, um, which are kind of impenetrable by bike. If you come from one side to the other uh, and you have to basically cross this huge highway and um, yeah we were here with the kids uh, last summer and uh, so I had asked the people here from camp uh, if they could get uh, like in Amsterdam everyone has these cargo bikes where they uh, put their kids in and go go around the city so uh, someone from uh, camp found a cargo bike here and we were going uh, with that cargo bike through the city and apparently someone took a picture of us biking through and then there was a politician like uh, who are these people thinking that cargo bikes are a good idea here and it's this is car city and I don't know what and it's, uh, yeah exactly and uh, before we know it will be all cargo bikes here <laughs> so yeah but I think like uh, even with the book I did on uh, Los Angeles like 
uh, it's a total car city, but like uh, when I started with that book and went around by car, like I felt I've, I missed so many opportunities to photograph places because you see something from the car, you have to find a parking place, walk back, and then that sort of moment was gone that like on the second day, I bought a foldable bike, which I put in the back of the car and went to areas and started biking there around. And that was a, a way to yeah, uh, uh, discover kind of a different um, uh, part of Los Angeles. Yeah, any other questions? Was there any problematic situation when you, when you photograph people? Was there any? Sorry. To? Was if if there was any problematic situation uh, when you when you photographed people? Uh, if in, you won't talk about it in general, course. or you mean here in Prague? Here, or here in here. Prague. No, no. Like what I said before, like uh, people were f very sort of in because the because I would I would assume <laughs> when you photograph homeless people, there would be some problem. But yeah, like of, of uh, with those kind of situations, you you usually you do introduce yourself. You tell a little bit uh, kind of what your interest is, um, and I feel like even under those kind of circumstances, and I photographed also under very d difficult circumstances, like in Venezuela or these kind of places. Um, yeah, like once you express that kind of interest in people, uh, show what you're doing, uh, you, people get also interested in what you what you're doing and uh, uh, often like that kind of interest opens a lot of other doors and of course there's people who sometimes don't want to show things and you uh, move on but uh, like in general uh, it's uh, that kind of curiosity opens also a lot of doors uh, often uh. Thank you. Yeah. no and feel free to come to me. I'm still around here for a while, but thanks so much uh, for joining here this morning. Thank you. Thank you.